A Manual of Etiquette, with hints on politeness and good breeding, by Daisy Eyebright. There's nothing in the world like etiquette, in kingly chambers or imperial halls, as also at the race and county balls. Men often speak of good manners as an accomplishment. I speak of them as a duty. What, then, are good manners? Such manners as the usages of society have recognized as being agreeable to men. Such manners as take away rudeness and remit to the brute creation all coarseness. There are a great many who feel that good manners are effeminate. They have a feeling that rude bluntness is a great deal more manly than good manners. It is a great deal more beastly. But when men are crowded in communities, the art of living together is no small art. How to diminish friction. How to promote ease of intercourse. How to make every part of a man's life contribute to the welfare and satisfaction of those around him. How to keep down offensive pride. How to banish the rasping of selfishness from the intercourse of men. How to move among men inspired by various and conflictive motives and yet not have collisions. This is a function of good manners. Not only is a violation of good manners inexcusable on ordinary grounds, but it is sinful. When, therefore, parents and guardians and teachers would inspire the young with a desire for the manners of good society, it is not to be thought that they are accomplishments which may be accepted or rejected. Every man is bound to observe the laws of politeness. It is the expression of goodwill and kindness. It promotes both beauty in the man who possesses it, and happiness in those who are about him. It is a religious duty, and should be a part of religious training. There is a great deal of contempt expressed for what is called etiquette in society. Now and then, there are elements of etiquette which perhaps might well be ridiculed, but in the main, there is a just reason for all these customs which come under the head of etiquette. There is a reason which as regard to facility of intercourse. There is a reason in the avoidance of offense. There is a reason in comfort and happiness and no man can afford to violate these unwritten customs of etiquette who wishes to act as a Christian gentleman. These pages have been prepared for those who are striving to improve themselves in exterior polish and to add to their stock of information concerning the subjects upon which it treats. It has not been written for those who have been trained in the best usages of society from their infancy, nor for those who learn politeness at the same time that they master the alphabet but for the less favored of both sexes in our land, who are desirous of obtaining a knowledge of the etiquette which governs social intercourse and are desirous of cultivating both politeness and good breeding. Its instructions are perfectly plain, practical, and simple. So simple that many persons may incline to ridicule them, but only in this way can we convey information to the many who are desirous of receiving it. Etiquette has been defined as a code of laws which binds society together viewless as a wind, and yet exercising a vast influence upon the well-being of mankind. These laws were instituted during the days ancient chivalry, but as years have flown they have been modified in a great degree, many of them being quite obsolete and others entirely changed. Some, however, have been but slightly varied to suit the times, being governed by the laws of good taste and common sense, and these not only facilitate the intercourse of persons in society, but are also essential to their ease and composure of manner. And manners, said the eloquent Edmund Burke, are of more importance than laws, for upon them in a great measure the laws depend. The laws can touch us here and there, now and then. Manners are what vex or soothe, corrupt or purify, exalt or debase, barbarize or refine, by constant, steady, uniform, and insensible operation, like that of the air we breathe in, they give their whole form and color to our lives. According to their quality, they add morals, they supply them, or they totally destroy them. It is often said that such a man's pleasant, affable manners made his fortune, and it is the truth that politeness and good breeding go far towards forming both a man and a woman's reputation, and stamp upon them, as it were, their current value in the circles wherein they move. Agreeable manners are very frequently the fruits of a good heart, and then they will surely please, even though they may lack somewhat of graceful courtly polish. There is hardly anything of greater importance to children of either sex than good breeding, and if parents and teachers would perform their duties faithfully, 
there would not be so much complaint concerning the manners of the American child of the period. Be courteous. It is an apostolical injunction which we should ever bear in mind. Let us train up our children to behave at home as we would have them act abroad. For we may be certain that, while they are children, they will conduct themselves abroad as they have been in the habit of doing, under similar circumstances at home. The new version of Solomon's proverb is said to run thus, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will go on training. But it is upon to several definitions. Enter a home where the parents are civil and courteous towards all within the family circle, where their guests are constant inmates, and you will see that their children are the same, that good manners are learned quite as much by imitation as by fixed rules or principles. Go into a family where the parents are rude, ill-bred, and indulge in disputations and unkind remarks, and you will find the children are rough, uncouth, and bearish. Good manners are not merely conventional rules, but are founded upon reason and good sense and are, therefore, most worthy of the consideration of all. And there are many points of good breeding, which neither time nor place will ever change, because they are founded upon a just regard of man for man. We frequently hear the questions asked, who is a lady and who is a gentleman? The answers may be difficult to supply on account of the great difference of opinion in various classes of society upon the subject. Some would declare that position, advantageous surroundings, great riches, high birth, or superior intelligence and education give the requisites. But all of our readers know of persons who possess some, one, or more of these advantages, and yet they cannot lay true claims to these desirable and distinctive appellation. Hence, we frequently hear these words, Ah, she is no lady, or indeed, he is no gentleman, applied to those whose standing is high, who possess much wealth, or are endowed with genius, but have neglected to add to their other advantages the touchstone of politeness and good breeding. Our reply to the question is that a well-bred lady is one who is true modesty and refinement, adds a scrupulous attention to the rights and feelings of those with whom she associates, whether they are rich or poor, and who is the same both in the kitchen or parlor. We recall the praise given by an Irishman to a friend of ours when he said, Truth and inad men, just as ye see her in the parlor, we see her in the kitchen. Never a cross word passed her lips, be it to rich or poor, servant or friend. This is a high meat of praise, and where a curtly address and ease of manner are added to it, we behold a true lady. Can we answer the other question? We will try. Whoever is true, loyal and sincere, whoever is of a humane and affable demeanor, and courteous to all, whoever is honorable in himself and in his judgment of others, and requires no law but his word to hold him to his engagements, such a man is a gentleman, whether he be dressed in broadcloth and in fine linen, or be clad in a blue homespun frock, whether his hands are white and soft, or hardened and stained with drudgery and toil. In a recent address made by the Bishop of Manchester, England, before the YMCS of Leeds, he said, Some people think a gentleman means a man of independent fortune, a man who fares sumptuously every day, a man who need not labor for his daily bread. None of these make a gentleman. Not one of them. Nor all of them together. I have known men when I was brought closer in contact with working men than I am brought now. I have known men of the roughest exterior, who have been used all their lives to follow the plough and to look after horses, as any nobleman who ever wore a ducal coronet. I mean I have known them as unselfish, I have known them as truthful, I have known them as sympathizing, and all these qualities go to make what I understand by the term a gentleman. It is a noble privilege which has been sadly prostituted. And what I want to tell you is that the humblest man in Leeds, who has the coarsest work to do, yet, if his heart be tender and pure and true, can be, in the most emphatic sense of the word, a gentleman. We all know that there are those in our midst who object to politeness or polite phrases because, as they say, the language is false and unmeaning, and company manners is a scornful term frequently applied to the courteous demeanor and many polite sentences which are often uttered and are so very well desirable in our well-bred society. In the common compliments of civilized life, there is no falsehood uttered, because there is no intention to deceive, and polite language is always agreeable to the ear, and leads a soothing influence to the heart, while unkind and rough words 
harshly uttered, are just the reverse. Children and animals recognize this truth quite as readily as adults. A baby will cry at the sound of harsh language, and your horse, cow, dog, or cat at all most amenable to kind words and caressing motions, and although, tis only man can words create, and cut the air to sounds articulate, by nature's special charter. Yet kindness is a language which the dumb can speak and the deaf can understand. We can convey the plainness of truth in a civil speech, and the most malignant of lies can also be wrapped in its precious words. But we cannot consider a love of truth any apology for rude and uncouth manners. Truth needs not be made harsh, unlovely, and morose, but should appear kind and gentle, attractive and pleasing. Roughness and honesty are, however, often met within the same person, but we are not competent judges of human nature. If we take ill manners to be a guarantee of property of heart, or think a stranger must be a knave because he possesses the outward seeming of a gentleman, doubtless there are many wolves in sheep's clothing in our land, but that does not decrease the value of gentleness and courtesy in the least. Good manners and a good conscience are very often twin sisters, and are always more attractive for the companionship. Bad manners are frequently a species of bad morals, and Goethe tells us, there is no outward sign of courtesy that does not rest on a deep moral foundation. Good manners are a very essential characteristic of religion also, as well as a fundamental part of civilization, and we are all in duty bound to treat those with whom we came into contact with consideration, respect, and deference. In the Epistle of St. James, we read the first Code of Etiquette and Good Manners which was ever given to men from high authority. The Greeks and Romans, to be sure, were strictly devoted to etiquette, but it was not the kind which springs from a conscience void of offense against God and men. The Chinese are the most minute of all nations in their form of etiquette, etc., and they have hundreds of books which treat upon politeness and good breeding. One of their treatises upon these subjects is said to contain over 3,000 articles. The custom of salutation, of visiting, of eating, of making presents, of introductions, writing letters, and the like, are all strictly defined, and they are enforced like our laws, no one being permitted to transgress them. We have been inclined to consider the Chinese as barbarians, while in fact they are a far more polite nation than our own. La Bruyere, a famous French writer, thus defines politeness. We may define politeness, though we cannot tell where to fix it in practice. It observes received usages and customs, is bound to times and places, and it's not the same thing in the two sexes or in different conditions. Wit alone cannot obtain it. It is acquired and brought to perfection by emulation. Some dispositions alone are susceptible of politeness, as others are only capable of great talents or solid virtues. It is true, politeness puts merit forward and renders it agreeable, and a man must have eminent qualifications to support himself without it. Politeness may also be said to be the embodiment of the golden rule, and without its aid, without the amenities of society, life is an arid waste, a barren plain. Gold will not supply the deficiencies of a pleasing deportment, and we can assure our readers that they will find courtesy in all times and at all places the cheapest and most available of commodities. In Europe, good manners are most highly esteemed and most assiduously inculcated both in the highest and the lowest classes. And the children are taught that it is very essential for them to show respect to their superiors and elders and to always be kind and courteous to their inferiors. In America, politeness and etiquette are well taught in these families who possess culture and refinement, but among the masses rarely taught at all. Our distinct schools were nurseries of good manners 30 or 40 years ago, compared to what they are at the present day. Then the country children were taught to bow to strangers passing by. Now they will be more likely to salute them with profanity or vulgarity. Good manners are surely at a discount in the United States. We cannot disguise this fact. It is seen by all who travel through the country, who frequent the city, who sail upon our rivers and our lakes, or whirl rapidly along our railways. The lower officials are often cross and surly, the higher sometimes extremely discourteous, and the want of good breeding is everywhere noted. Surely we should ask ourselves a question. Whence has this condition of affairs arisen? Our democratic principles should not be allowed to lead us to indulge in discourtesy and thus throw a shadow of disgrace upon our institutions, and those who consider the rules which regulate society needless and absurd would, 
if they were laid aside, soon desire their restoration, as they are a needful barrier against rudeness and vulgarity. There are, doubtless, many eccentricities of fashion, yet they soon pass away, but some prescribed regulations for conduct are essential for the preservation of order and dignity. Etiquette is intended to guard us from some of the inconveniences of a large acquaintance, and by settling certain points, it permits us to maintain a ceremonious acquaintance with a circle much too large for social visiting. Therefore, let us study with care politeness that must teach the modest forms of gesture and of speech, and vain formality with machin mien, and pertness apes with her familiar grin. They against nature for applauses strain, distort themselves, and give all others pain.